The creative process behind getting dressed in the dark and all my songs are, I mean, I can give you a complicated answer, but simply put, I lived it. These are songs I lived. I saw with my own eyes, and I tend to write uh, more like a journalist or an historian than I do as a crafty songwriter. I don't really sit down in a room and go, imagine what might happen if this happened. Uh, you know, I have. That's just not where I am right now. Okay, so when I wrote Pray For You, like when I write any song, I can tell you if it's a good song or not when I write it, but I can't determine what a hit is. The only way to determine what a hit is is if the audience likes it, they buy it. That's what a hit means. I mean, I, I don't buy my own song, so I'm not really the guy to decide that. So I decided to play it live, and the first time I played it live, the fans went bonkers, like nothing I'd ever seen before, especially not for some opening act where they're asleep at the wheel, and I hit the song, and they're just like, ah! So I had you know, 8,000 people going berserk. And then I played it for two more, two more shows, and I knew I had something. So I went in the studio to record it. And again, being fan-led, I didn't pick the song. I had thought there was another song that was going to be our first single. But there was something happening with this. So I went into the studio and recorded it and stuck it out online. I was like, this, we got to go with this. Something's happening here. And the fans are telling me that this is what they want. So we put the uh, song online. and. Literally, the rest is history. It spread like kudzu. So I moved to Nashville because I wanted to be around people that loved music, all genres. This town is not, not, no longer just a country town. It's got, you know, it's a music city. Uh, but I needed to leave. LA because I was too comfortable there and I knew if I was going to start over again I needed to humble myself and go back to square one and I couldn't do it living you know in a comfortable lifestyle in LA. That isn't to say that you know Nashville is not comfortable. I feel very comfortable here but uh, I just had my family and my close friends and my life for the last 12 years there. I needed to leave that in order to reinvent myself and I chose to come to Nashville because I'd made a record here in 2002 and uh, I'd been coming to Nashville, born and raised in Atlanta, Georgia. I've been coming here since 94, since my career started, spending summers and writing. And, and it just felt logical. I wanted, again, I wanted to be around other artists. And uh, I didn't really pick to go country. I set out to make a, a Jaren record, just to tell the songs and stories and, you know, that, that were me. And again, that's why the album's titled Getting Dressed in the Dark, because I didn't know where I was going to land. It was just sort of this blind faith and hope that I would be embraced somewhere. And when I took to social media, the fans that gravitated towards the single Pray For You, the first ones to come on board were the country music fans. And I'd long since heard that they were the ones, you know, they're, they're the, the rabid fans that, 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 you know, grab onto their, their favorite artists and they don't, they don't let go. And in my case, you know, they did that, but they also took me one step further. They, they essentially broke the single. I mean, any, 90% of the radio stations in this country today will tell you that the first time they heard Pray For You, they heard it from a listener or they heard it from another radio station. Now, I've been in the music business 17 years. I've never heard that before. I mean, I've heard of it, but it never happened to me. Um, the fondest memories of being on the road with Evan and Jaren was the fact that I got to play with my brother every day. There's nothing like it. It's much fun as being, you know, doing this Jaren and Long Road to Love thing. This is great, and it's me. It's got its, its pros and, and, and I love it. But the con is that, you know, I don't, I don't get to do it with my brother. And given the opportunity, yeah, I'd switch. I'd go right back to Evan and Jaren and do that. It's not that I don't love this. I do. But, you know, just to imagine the, you know, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, fun, I'm a fun guy. I like me. But, you know, I like two of me better, you know? It's a lot of fun and more fun to, I mean, this is like Evan and Jaren right here. It's just, I mean, it's like, it's like summer camp. And, um, you know, for us, it was, it, it was never like, it was never the Everly Brothers fight or, you know, who was, who was the more talented one. He always said I was the more talented one. It was fun. No, he'll tell you he's the more. No, we, we got along. We loved each other. We, we love each other and we got along great. And you can't beat that relationship. You can't beat that experience. Nothing will ever replace that. But, um, uh, and he's incredibly involved with what I'm doing now behind the scenes. So 
hopefully um, I'll be able to we'll be able to tack on some more of those experiences at some point. But you know, this is where I am now, and I'm not leaving. I am, uh, God, I'm inspired by so many. I'm inspired by anything that's good that I hear all the time. I mean, I turn, I can't turn off this, uh, you know, Jared Neiman lover, lover song. I love it. I can't get enough of it. I like, I like the people that are in my class. I mean, I like, the, uh, you know, James Otto. The guy's like the Marvin Gaye of country. I just fell in love with him. He's fantastic. Um, Toby Keith, I've been a fan for many, many years. Um, I love that he's got a point of view. I always know a Toby Keith song when it comes on the radio. He's got an edge. He does it his way, and I love that. Brad Paisley is, uh, you know, he's got his own thing too, and I love how clever he is. And the guy obviously spends a lot of time on his lyrics, and I appreciate that. Um, I mean, everybody, it's so hard. I mean, I, I, I'm just in this year right now. Before I even go back, I mean, there's Tim, there's Keith, there's... Um, I tend to like more of the male artists, but that, I mean, I like, I, I like Carrie Underwood a lot. I like Taylor Swift. I mean, I mean, I, I mean, and again, not only am I inspired by them, I'm influenced by them. I mean, if you think about uh, the, Taylor Swift, was you know, she sort of brought that honesty. She sort of broke that wall, and she was really the first one to take those private conversations and make them public before I did. So, it was it, it was easier. It's been easier for me, I think, to to get through when people go, oh, that's kind of like Taylor Swift. So she, she sort of knocked down a lot of walls for me. So <clears throat> Bill Anderson and I are, are like the unlikely buddies, but we get along great. We love each other. He is a legend and somebody that I think is so clever and I love his music. And he has become like my biggest champion in music. And this past weekend at the Opry, he and I sang Pray For You together. And it was pretty cool. So in the song where I, I say, so I listened to the preacher as he told me what to do, he said, and then Bill takes over. He's like, you can't go hating others who have done wrong to you. Sometimes we get angry. But, and he does that part, and it's great. And then I look up at him and I go, thanks, Reverend Bill. I think I might. And I just go, all right, and I pray for you. He's like, you know, so you just pray, you know, let the good Lord do his job, and you just pray for them. I'm like, thanks, Reverend Bill. I think I'll do that. And I just go into the song. And it was really cool because... We got to do that together. We were able to, you know, the guy's got 50 years of experience of playing. I mean, he's been on the Opry since, I think they built the Opry around him. So, you know, and uh, it's just, uh, to have him in my corner is great. So I think I realized that I had some talent when I was a kid. We used to sit around the table and my parents at the dinner table would give us all parts and we would sing different parts, which was sort of my first uh, entree into doo-wop. You know, a little silly, but that's what we did. And then um, I don't think I cared that I had any musical talent because I was so into sports until <clears throat> I was, uh, my brother and I spent this, uh, we had a, like a week uh, at Destin in Florida and we saw these two dudes that were kind of goofy. They were playing guitar. And there were like 200 girls around them. And Evan's like, what do you think, man? I'm like, I know, right? So uh, that's still, I was that lazy, still didn't motivate me. But Evan started playing guitar. And then uh, a few years later, we started, you know, we started a band. And I sort of didn't really know it was my calling. I started, I didn't even play an instrument when we started. I was still just sort of not committed. It was Evan's vision and his dream. And I, I sort of went along with it. And then about a year and a half or two, and you know, I set out, I think, for the wrong reasons, just to meet girls and whatever. And then somewhere along the way, I became an artist, and it started to connect. And I was like, wait a second, I actually, maybe I should, you know, care about this a little bit more. And I did. I started becoming really meticulous about my lyrics, and I, I became just really critical of myself and really spent a lot of time just writing and rewriting and writing and rewriting and then and then I lost I wasn't so sure I would say late 20s I needed a break from music I was like this can't be everything this isn't this isn't what I'm meant to do and I remember a friend of mine said to me that uh, 
He said, someday you'll realize that your talent belongs to everybody, it's not just your own, that you have social responsibility and that um, you can't leave, you have to come back and you'll, you'll discover that. And only last year did I realize that I was able to find a, 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 a bigger calling in life than just music, but be able to do music and fulfill that, that larger calling as well. And, um, and I don't mean it in a religious way, I mean it in a, in a social responsibility way, in a way of um, really taking the gift that I have and being able to give it back and share with people and helping maybe put words, you know, give people words to experiences they've had or make them laugh or um, whatever it is. And um, so I feel for the first time in my life, probably in the last year, where I'm really settled, I'm like, this is, I know 100% that this is what I'm supposed to be doing and it's incredibly liberating.